Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked graphically about the cardiomyocyte action potential. So this is the action potential that is triggering a cardiac muscle cell. So the muscle cells of the myocardium of the heart to contract. Okay, we're not talking about pacemaker cells that we talked about long before. So go back and take a look at that video and the mental organizer that I've got in the description. Okay, um, this is for the cardiomyocyte, and this is graphically what it looked like. What we're going to look at now is actually uh, what's actually going on physiologically inside the cell, not just the graph. And before we look at what happens here inside the cardiomyocyte, I want to do a really brief recap of one of the major differences between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. And that's what we have here called gap junctions. Okay. Um, yes, heart muscle cells have intercalated discs, but the major thing that's relevant here are what are called gap junctions. So this right here, this is a, a channel that's created by gap junctions. Over here on the left, this is one cardiomyocyte. Over here on the right, this is another one. And notice that this gap junction forms a channel between these two cardiomyocytes. And so with this gap junction, you can actually have ions that move unidirectionally from this cell right here through the channel to this cell. Okay? What these gap junctions do is they allow for very rapid spread of an action potential. That just means that the ions that trigger an action potential, instead of having to move the action potential along the membrane, the ions can simply flow from this cell to this cell directly through the gap junction. And that allows the action potential to be much faster, which is important for the heart that needs to continually contract, but also in the case when heart rate becomes elevated, it allows, again, for that rapid spread of the action potential. We don't see that in skeletal muscle. So now let's look at what happens physiologically during the action potential. This entire square right here, this represents one cardiac muscle cell. Down here in red, this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then over here, this is the sarcomere of that cardiomyocyte. Okay, Here's a gap junction right here and this assume is going to be connected to another cell adjacent to it on the left. I haven't drawn that. But in any case, the first step is positively charged ions, so cations, are going to move through the gap junction through the cardiomyocyte over here to the left into this cardiomyocyte. All right. Now at rest, the resting membrane potential of the cardiomyocyte is approximately negative 90 millivolts. Okay? So it's very negative, even more so than skeletal muscle or neurons. However, when these positively charged ions move into this cardiomyocyte through the gap junction, the resting membrane potential actually gets a little bit more positive, and it goes up to negative 70 millivolts, which is just a little bit more positive than resting membrane potential. Okay? But it's negative 70 millivolts, right? and this is due strictly to these positively charged ions that came in from the adjacent cardiomyocyte through the gap junction. And it's actually these ions that come in and move it to negative 70 that are actually going to trigger all the subsequent events. So when we move these positively charged ions in, this channel right here, which is called a voltage-gated sodium channel, it's going to be triggered to open. Right? So this voltage-gated sodium channel, when the membrane potential is still at rest, negative 90 millivolts, this channel's closed. However, when these positive ions come in, okay, this voltage-gated sodium channel kind of senses that. It senses the change to negative 70, and so this voltage-gated sodium channel will open, and you'll have sodium influx into the cardiomyocyte. Right? So that's the third thing that happens, sodium influx into the cardiomyocyte. And there's going to be so much sodium influx that the membrane potential is going to move from negative 70 all the way to positive 30 millivolts. And again, that's corresponding to this segment right here where we get the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels. We go from about negative 70 all the way up to about positive 30, so a massive change in the membrane potential. Okay? So now we're at positive 30. Now once we get these sodium ions here inside the cardiomyocyte and the membrane potential is therefore positive 30, we're really going to get two things to happen. Okay? Two voltage-gated channels are going to open around the same time, although this one over here is going to open slightly before the other one. 
This is a voltage-gated potassium channel. So when the membrane potential gets to about positive 30, this channel opens, okay? And it causes potassium efflux out of the cell, okay? Now technically this potassium channel opens slightly first. That's why in the next phase we actually see the membrane potential actually going a little bit more negative just for a very short amount of time. And so initially there's going to be a little bit of repolarization. But very quickly after these potassium channels open, we're also going to get these voltage-gated calcium channels to open. And so a bunch of calcium is going to rush into the cardiomyocyte. And really for a while, the amount of potassium that's leaving the cell is going to be balanced by the amount of calcium coming in. And the key word there I want to emphasize is balance. And so if we have about the same amount of potassium that's effluxing out as the amount of calcium influxing in, then we shouldn't change the membrane potential at all. Okay, And that's why we see this plateau. Now initially, yes, we do have the potassium channels open for a little bit first, so yeah, we get a little repolarization, but just generally speaking, once those calcium channels open, it's balanced with the potassium efflux, and we have this plateau, okay? And so this plateau is due to the simultaneous opening of the potassium channels and the calcium channels, both of which are voltage-gated, and both open when the membrane potential is about positive 30. And so we get this plateau. Now, technically, the memory potential will be a little bit below 30, but the main thing I want to emphasize here is this plateau, okay, that we have when both of these are open. The other thing that I want to mention here is that when the calcium channels are open and we get this calcium influx, the calcium has another function, and we're going to explore that on the next slide. These calcium ions are going to trigger the release of more calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is just an organelle very similar to the endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, it is endoplasmic reticulum. But in muscle cells, it stores calcium. And so this calcium that came in through the voltage-gated calcium channel is going to come over here, and it's going to trigger the release of more calcium from the SR through this channel and into the sarcoplasm, okay? So let's actually look at that. And these are now events that are occurring during the plateau. So we're talking specifically about what's going on during the plateau when we've got both potassium channels and calcium channels open, okay? So first of all, we get calcium influx into the sarcoplasm. That I've already mentioned. So calcium moves through this voltage-gated calcium channel and we get some in the sarcoplasm. But then the calcium is going to come over here, step seven, and trigger the release of more calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we see here calcium is moving out into the sarcoplasm. Okay? And so this is going to be the majority of the calcium. Yeah, we get some through the voltage-gated calcium channel here, but the vast majority of calcium that's going to end up in the sarcoplasm is going to be coming from the SR. And because the calcium from up here triggered the release of calcium from the SR, we call this calcium-induced calcium release. This is not something we see in skeletal muscle. In skeletal muscle, it's mechanically induced calcium release. In cardiac muscle, it's calcium-induced calcium release. All right? And so we get this flood of calcium into the sarcoplasm. This is all occurring during the plateau phase. All right? And then this calcium, once in the sarcoplasm, it's going to come over to the sarcomere, and it's going to trigger the events of cross-bridge cycling, and we're going to get shortening of the cardiomyocyte and overall contraction of that part of the heart. Okay, And again, I'm not going to go into much detail on the cross-bridge cycling. We'll save that for a separate video. But I just want to emphasize that all of this, that is steps 7, 8, and 9, all of this is occurring during the plateau phase. So if we look at this graph, We've got, of course, the influx of calcium that's occurring at the same time as the efflux of potassium. We've got calcium-induced calcium release from the SR, and then cross-bridge cycling and shortening of the muscle. Okay? But what we see is after the plateau is done, the calcium channels are going to inactivate. They're going to close, but we're going to continue to have potassium efflux. So let's look at that. 
So notice here the calcium channels are now closed. There's no longer calcium coming in, but we still have the potassium that's effluxing. And so if potassium is effluxing and positive charges are leaving the cell, then we're going to have the cell become overall more negative. And in fact, what's going to happen is we're going to take the membrane potential from positive 30. Technically, it's a little bit below that at the end of the plateau, but it's going to go all the way back to the resting level, which is negative 90 millivolts. And that's because these potassium channels stay open and we get potassium efflux. So hopefully that makes sense. And all of this steps 10, 11, and through the end here, this is all happening during repolarization. Okay? So this is happening over here in region three of this graph. So where we're repolarizing back to membrane potential. Right? So calcium channels close, potassium is still effluxing, and the membrane potential moves from positive 30 millivolts back to negative 90 millivolts. All right? Now, in order to terminate the contraction of the heart, however, we need to get rid of the calcium, right? Because as long as there's calcium in the sarcoplasm, right, it's going to cause these uh, sarcomeres to remain in the contracted, shortened state. And if they don't go back to their resting state, then the heart cell would just remain contracted, and that would be tetany. And you can never have tetanus in a heart cell, otherwise you'd stop pumping blood. It has to relax, and then it can contract again but it's always going to be in the contracted state if calcium remains out here. So we have to do one of two things. We have to either get rid of the calcium by moving it back into the SR, or we have to pump the calcium out of the cell. And both of these things actually occur. And so one of the ways, as I mentioned, to get rid of the calcium from the sarcoplasm, and therefore the sarcomere, is to move it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, this is done through a calcium pump in the membrane of the SR, and also with the assistance of this protein called calcequestrin, which is also present in skeletal muscle as well. Okay? But very important to get that calcium back into the SR. The other thing we can do with the calcium is simply actively transport it out of the cell. And that's again through another calcium pump that's going to move the calcium out of the cardiomyocyte and into the extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid outside here. Okay, But this is all taking place during repolarization. And think about it, if we're relaxing, which is what occurs during repolarization, relaxation of the heart implies we need to get rid of the calcium. Otherwise, the sarcomere is going to remain in the contracted state. It needs to relax. It needs to come apart. And so we need to get that calcium either back in the SR or out of the cell. Okay? And eventually, once this membrane potential gets back to negative 90, this potassium channel will close and everything will reset to start the next um, action potential of the cardiomyocyte. Okay? But the main thing I wanted to at least hopefully get you to understand through this video is that there's a lot of things happening during each one of these steps. Okay? But hopefully through seeing what's going on in the diagram right here, you get a good understanding of what's going on physiologically in the cardiomyocyte. All right? Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.